Brexit is not about left versus right. If you ask, is it about good versus evil? <laughs> that, that is for you to decide. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kissin. And this is a show for you if you're bored of watching people having arguments on the internet over subjects they know nothing about. At Trigonometry, we don't pretend to be the experts, we ask the experts. Our fantastic guest this week is a polling expert and one of this country's leading political scientists. Sir John Curtis, welcome to Trigonometry. Thanks for having me, nice to be here. It's so good to have you here. Not at uh, all. For anyone who doesn't know who you are, which is not many people, uh, given that you're on, on TV all the time, tell <laughs> us a little bit about how are you where you are, what's been your journey through life, and what do you do now? Well, um, I guess I am best known for these days for being the public face for the BBC on election night programmes. Um, probably somewhat less known is actually I've been doing election night programs since 1979, but I spent a lot of time working on the production side of television, helping to crunch the numbers, etc. without necessarily being in front of camera. So uh, it, the front of camera stuff, at least on election night, has been, been, been rather more recent. Um, how did I end up there? Well, that's a long story, but basically... Um, the person who was my graduate supervisor when I was doing a PhD was David Butler now. So David Butler, who was the doyen of election television in the 1950s and 1960s. He needed somebody in the 1979 election to sit behind him with a programmable calculator. This is kind of the early days of computing because he didn't quite want to rely on the BBC computer and he needed somebody behind him who could calculate the swing very quickly for him when a result came in. Um, if indeed the BBC computer were to fail. Well, the BBC computer actually didn't fail on the night, but I still got to sit in behind it. And then after that, actually, somebody else who was also involved in the BBC uh, operation called Clive Payne persuaded the BBC, this is now 1981, very, very early days of a PC computing. And he said, look, if we turn up with what in those days was called a research machines 380Z, which you had to program yourself in basic. I mean, you know, none of this kind of software stuff all sitting on your mm. Apple or your, or your PC or whatever. So this is pre-PC days, but very early uh, uh, small computers. And we turned up and we persuaded the BBC that if they gave us the results for the then Greater London Council election 1981, we could put them through our sausage machine and we could tell them about the swings, et cetera, et cetera. And then out of that grew, grew up and we persuaded the BBC that actually we could start doing uh, instant on the night analysis, which then their commentators could use. So that's how it all started. But then beyond that, there's obviously another backstory. Um, that's not my day job. It's not my professional mm -hmm. job. My professional job is an academic political scientist. Um, but I'm primarily interested in voting pay for electoral systems, uh, but also more generally social and political attitudes. Um, I ended up at Strathclyde basically because that was one of the two institutions in the UK, which in the early days of what in political science we call the behavioral revolution, which is the idea that if you're going to study politics, it isn't just about what politicians do or what constitutions say. But actually, it's about trying to understand how people behave politically. And that also means the focus moves away from just what happens in parliament or in governments or whatever, but also to looking at the general public. Um, and uh, Strathclyde, and, and that involves, by the way, therefore doing surveys and numbers, etc. Strathclyde, together with Essex, one of two places that really embraced this early on. So when I was approached by Strathclyde to come and do it, I went, yeah, so that's great. Previously, I was at Liverpool before that. I mean, backstory before that, the question usually people ask me was, how is it you got involved in interested in voting behaviour? <laughs> Answer, don't know. <laughs> All I can tell you is that my first political memory is of the death of Hugh Gates School in, what, 1962, 1963, and the Labour leadership election that was then, that Howard Wilson then won. And remember being allowed to say, this is, what, the age of 10 by my or 11 by my parents um, to watch the beginning at least of the 1964 election night results program. So by this point, somehow now, at least I got interested in the horse race and the fact there were different political parties. There was a degree of political involvement in my family and later my mother indeed did become a local councillor, um, but certainly not active party politics. 
yes, they used to, I mean, they used to argue. I mean, my, my mother and at least one of her brothers and her father would argue about politics. They were all, all different views. What was the split within the family? Well, well I mean, my, 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 fa my grandfather was one of the early activists inside the Labour Party uh, in Cornwall. And, and, his, and, I, and I think my mother's brother was Labour. My mother was much more uh, Liberal Party um, inclined. Mm. Um, but, you know, but they, they would, you know, they, they, but anyway, but to be honest, there isn't enough there to explain. So somehow or another, I was always interested yeah. in this and, you know, then went to university and then went on to do a graduate studies in this area. So that's, that's the kind of, that's the ultimate backstory. Well, fantastic. And talking about polling and numbers, uh, mm -hmm. in the last two or three years, there have been, I can think of one or two incidents where pollsters haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. Yeah. I think uh, Trump and Brexit might be good good examples of that. Well, I will question you about both of those. Fantastic. Anyway. Well, question, that's the, that's the, that, that makes trigonometry what it is, is when we get destroyed by, I guess. That's the best <laughs> Normally, thing. it's me getting destroyed, so well, I'm okay. quite enjoying let's, this. Let's, let, 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 let's take it. I mean, uh, the 2015 general election is an unalloyed uh, disappointment for the polling industry mm. because not only did, on average, all the polls essentially point towards Conservative and Labour being neck and neck with each other, um, but actually they all did so, and there was very little difference between them. And in the end, I've forgotten what it was now, the Conservatives were you know, five, six, seven, eight points ahead. Mm. Um, so that was clearly a wrong call. Um, I'll come back to the, to, to the, reasons, why, to the reasons why in a moment. Um, the other examples that people cite are less obvious. So let's take... you. you you quoted Trump. Well, actually, be, bear in mind that on average, the uh, polls of how people were going to vote in the US presidential election had Hillary Clinton three points ahead. Mm -hmm. She won by two points in mm -hmm. the popular vote, right? Mm -hmm. So okay. don't blame the polls for the errors of, if that's the correct word, how the Electoral College operates, okay? Mm. Uh, 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 Trump won despite not winning the popular vote. Yes, we can then argue about the performance of the polls in certain individual Midwestern states, but I can actually point you to a piece I wrote on polling day itself. I tried to keep out of American politics, but eventually somebody persuaded me to write something. He said, look, actually, <laughs> if you look at the polls carefully enough, yeah, it looks as though Hillary Clinton's got about 250 Electoral College votes in the back, but she hasn't got 270. She could lose. Come back to Brexit. Uh, the other one you cited. Um, the truth is, if you actually look at all of the opinion polls that were conducted during the official four weeks of the campaign, there were slightly more that had leave ahead than had remain ahead. What is true is that in the, the last few polls, there was something of a movement back towards Remain, although even amongst the final polls, there were two out of the six or seven or so that had leave ahead. But on average, you might, you know, remain were ahead. But what was going on there, remember, is that there was a widespread expectation that the polls would get it wrong. They would get it wrong because we all know, don't we, that what happens in big constitutional referendums is that the public draw back at the last minute from voting from what seems a rather risky option for change. So when the polls, and virtually all the polls the week before the, the, the Brexit referendum had leave ahead, they, some of them then swung back and people said, ah, oh, right, we know what's happening. It's obvious that people are swinging back to remain and remain are okay. Well, they didn't swing back any further. And actually the polls had, you know, were, were, were a little bit out. But in particular, if you, if you had tracked what the polls that had been done uh, online were saying, Ever since September 2016, uh, sorry, September 2015, from the moment when we knew what was going to be the question on the ballot paper, the polls that were done online called it 50-50 from the beginning. It remained 50-50 all the way through. And anybody, or anybody who thought that it was clear that Remain was going to win were betting against the polls. They were not reflecting what the polls were saying. Okay, 2017, a bit more complicated. Uh, 2017, again, here... Um, you know, having underestimated the Conservative performance in 2015, uh, the polls on average overestimate the Conservative <laughs> performance in 2017, but not all of them do, okay? Uh, YouGov had more than one exercise, but one of the exercises actually slightly underestimated how well the Conservatives are going to do. Uh, Servation had a poll which, again, uh, you know, uh, slightly underestimated uh, the, the, the Conservative lead, um, but they weren't all in the same count. Now, 2015 and 2017 are related. Now, one of the things is the, 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 the simplest story about 2015 is this, is that if you, 
the, the headline figures you get out of opinion polls aren't just simply the number of conservative Labour voters, etc. that the polls have uh, interviewed. Pollsters appreciate that trying to interview a relatively but adequate number of people in a short period of time is an exercise where at the end of the day you are going to struggle to get a wholly representative set of, uh, 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 sample of the population. So what do they do? Well, there are two things they're doing. One is they're going and saying, well, look, you know, we think, you know, we can see that as compared with what we know about the population in general, this poll is too light on X. And one obvious thing you can do is say, look, hang on, for the purposes of argument, only 30% of our people say they voted Labour in the last election. I know the real figure was 34. I need to upweight the number of Labour voters in our poll, perhaps. Um, so one of the things that they're going on is that they're, they're weighting their data demographically to try and make sure that it's right. The other thing that they're doing is saying, well, hang on. I mean, some of my people I've interviewed are going to vote. Some of them are not. I've got to try to work out who is and who isn't. So they also try to take into account the possibility of differential turnout. So in other words, the headline figures you get aren't just simply the unalloyed numbers. They're also then the numbers you get after the data have been processed. Well, the polls did a lot of processing in 2015, but not only was it the case that the headline number in the polls was Conservative Labour, even Stevens. If you went back to the original raw data, i.e. before they'd done any weighting and filtering or whatever, it was also a dead heat. So the truth is, at the end of the day, all the attempts they had for weighting and filtering didn't do anything. What was clear was, therefore, that the samples were too pro-Labour. Mm -hmm. Now, why might this be the case? And this is where life has got more difficult for pollsters. This at least is part of the explanation. One of the things that's long been true is that younger people are less likely to turn out and vote. This is almost an iron law of politics. But one of the things that's changed is that whereas even 10 years ago, certainly 15, 20 years ago, how old you were was for the most part only weakly related to your probability of voting Conservative or Labour. In 2015, this was no longer the case. It was already the case, this is pre-Corbyn, that the, the Labour Party was gaining ground amongst younger voters and losing ground, relatively speaking, amongst older voters. So, the, so the, in other words, the relationship between age and how people were voting was becoming more important. This therefore meant that estimating correctly the age difference in turnout have become more important. Mm. But what you can see from looking at the 2015 polls is that actually they were all underestimating the age difference in time. Because the problem, one of the problems the polls has, if you're trying to do a poll in two or three days, is, you know, and you ring somebody up or you send somebody an email saying, can you please do my poll? If you're interested in politics, you go, oh, gee whiz, fantastic, I'll fill in that poll. If on the other hand, you're an, an ordinary sane person and not terribly interested <laughs> in politics, <laughs> You go, you know what? That's an offer I could refuse. Yeah. <laughs> so therefore, one of the, so they, they tend to get more of the people who are politically interested. Now, that's fine in the sense that what you want to get, you're going to get the people who go to the polls. But if along the way, the young people in particular that you interview are markedly more interested in politics than other young people, mm -hmm. and there's then a relationship between how people vote and age, you're going to have trouble. So essentially, one of the reasons, at least, why the samples were too pro-Labour is that yes, the people whom they the young people whom they interviewed in 2015 turned out to vote and they voted Labour. The trouble is they weren't typical of all young people. There were lots of other young people who didn't turn out to vote, although perhaps they were Labour inclined, and so therefore they're overestimating uh, Labour success. So that's part of the story. Now, 2017 is a classic <laughs> case of be careful of trying to fight the last battle. Mm. Because ironically, if we now redo the same exercise, I said to you, remember in 2015, look at the raw, unweighted data, the polls are wrong. After weighting, the polls are just as wrong. The same is not true in 2017. If in 2017, you look at the raw, unweighted data, in most cases, it has the Conservatives uh, you know, uh, uh, moderately ahead, but only moderately ahead. The problem, uh, but, but no more than that, the problem is that um, in 2017, the pollsters were doing all sorts of things to their data 
to say, look, actually, I now know that those young voters are not going to turn out and vote. I now know I'm at risk of getting too many Labour voters. So they engage in various strategies, which ends up you know, uh, increasing, their, uh, uh, coming up with a bigger estimate of the age gap in turnout, of downweighting their Labour voters and over-egging the pudding. So they end up, as a result, underestimating their performance, not because that's what their raw data was telling them, but because in trying to correct for their overestimate of Labour support in 2015, they, uh, uh, they basically overcompensated for the problems of 2015 and what they report in 2017. And ironically, you know, the company that, in terms of using an ordinary poll, that got closest to the result with Salvation, is the one company that decided not to fiddle from what it did in 2015. So... Um, uh, so that, that, that's an example of, you know, I mean, polling has got more difficult for a whole variety of reasons. And there is no doubt that this relationship between age and how people vote and the fact that that then interacts with turnout has made it more difficult. Um, but uh, certainly um, it's a case of de demonstrating how it is difficult to get the polling numbers right. Because, again, the only thing you have to remember this and I'll stop. <laughs> if, if, you were, if you were commissioning me as a pollster and... You said, look, I've got this, like, you know, you're a comedian. You said, I've got this new comedy show. And you were, you were to do a two-minute um, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 example of what you're going to do. And you say, you know, go out amongst the public and uh, tell me you know, what proportion of the comedy market I would get if I were to ru run a comedy show like this. Can you get uh, a negative proportion of the comedy market? Well, <laughs> you, you, might, you, might, you might be able <laughs> yeah. to. But anyway, so, 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 so let us say for the purpose of argument, so look, you know what? If you were to run comedy shows like that, maybe it's a new genre. Let's say you're, you've, you've created a new genre of comedy show and you were to say, if I were to create this genre and I were to, to trademark it, and market it, you know, what proportion of the comedy industry would I have? And I said to you, 30% on the basis of my market research. And two years later, you come back and you say, apart from counting all the money you've got, I've got 25% in the market. You'd probably say, that was a pretty good job. Right? You'd say, actually, you told me I had a marketable product here. You told me how to sell it. Gee whiz, it worked. But if I told you that you were going to get 30% of the vote and you only got 25, you'd be deeply, deeply disappointed because we have an electoral system in the UK that means that relatively small errors get magnified mm. when it comes to uh, the outcome inside the House of Commons. I feel deeply, deeply sorry for pollsters because isn't this the most difficult time ever to be a pollster where you have two parties, Conservative and Labour at the moment, and they're hemorrhaging MPs, therefore hemorrhaging support. You could argue they're not really representing whole swathes of the population. Well, there are two things to say that. One, of course, is to say we've been here before. Um, for those of us who are old enough to remember the 1980s, the fact that a new party has been created um, raises exactly the same polling uh, issues that were raised when the Social Democratic Party was first formed in 91. There was a raging debate inside the polling industry about, so how do we best measure support for this new party? Should we just include it in the list of parties that people can choose among? Or do we say to people, oh, look, by the way, you know, there's been this new party formed, blah, 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 right? Now, how do you think you might vote in the next election? So in other words, do you or do you not prompt? The danger with not prompting is that people forget that this new party has been formed because it's not yet really in their consciousness and you end up underestimating their support. But the risk with prompting is you uh, and basically say, well, look, there's a risk of saying, oh, by the way, you know, there's this new party, you know, I mean, I'm sure you're not going to vote for it, right? It begins to potentially to lead people. And certainly we've already seen very dramatic differences in the estimated level of support for the so-called independent group. We've had polls putting them at five or six, not prompted. Others putting them at 14 or 18, prompted. Mm. Truth might be somewhere in between. So this is a... To that extent, at least, you know, this is an old problem. This is when new parties get formed, and particularly very early on, and frankly, you know, 
most voters are not following the soap opera of Westminster that closely. They may not even be following your programme that closely. <laughs> um, well, we're getting this um, left, right, <laughs> centre here. That was um, the nicest burn I've ever received yeah. in my uh, life. Ouch! Um, is, Ouch! Is 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 that is, is Sir the, John destroys <laughs> trigonometry? Is that is that? But I'm sure you have a brilliant and very um, attentive audience. Um, <laughs> That's even worse. Is 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 is, is, is that is that the? Um, is that, you know, therefore you know it's going to take a while before actually, frankly, you know, the, the thing is percolated into the yeah. public and they've and they've and they've yeah. made some sense of it uh, one way or the other. The second point you make about is difficulty about our political parties. Well, I mean, again, I could give you another long lecture here, but let me give you the short version. I mean, what is undoubtedly true is that Brexit has proven deeply disruptive because the division between Conservative and Labour in our country and, and the division that these two parties are basically orientated towards discussing and are relatively com comfortable discussing is the division between left and right. So those on the left are those essentially are people who think that society is too unequal and that the government should be doing something about it. Those on the right are those who say, look, at the end of the day, if we're all going to be better off, we need to create the incentives for people to take risks. And that therefore means that they, at the end of the day, some people who successfully take risks have to be well paid. So you know, that's a continuing argument in our society about what's the best way uh, to advance. Now, that's essentially the difference between left and right. And that is the division that for the most part at election time, you know, if you are right wing, you more likely to vote conservative, if you're left wing, you're more likely to vote Labour. However, Brexit is not about left versus right. If you is ask, it about good versus evil? <laughs> that, that is for you to decide. Okay? John, before you go on, this is what happens every time. Both Francis and I voted Remain, but we're both quite concerned about, you know, uh, democracy being thwarted and all the rest of it. But just to annoy a lot of our audience, every time we mention the fact that I mention the fact that we voted Remain, mm -hmm. Francis says... Because we're good people. <laughs> uh, and then we get a massive wall of YouTube comments uh, having a go at us for saying that. And it's now well, become a joke. I mean, you, 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 you. We're not trying to pin you down. but You're, uh, you're, you're inflicted on yourself. We, have, <laughs> uh, we now have people saying, when are you going to start selling T-shirts, which say, which say, I voted Remain because I'm a good person. So we'll get there. Anyway. Well, Cap well goodness, goodness is in the eye of the I'm beholder. Really glad, I'm really glad you, you started talking about okay. it because I was going to ask you about left and right. right, right well, it, it's yeah. not a crucial thing to, and, it, and it's widely mi misunderstood. Brexit was not about left versus right. We weren't arguing in the EU referendum about the role of the state in the economy mm. and how do we best in inequality. We were talking about immigration, about sovereignty, and what our relations should be towards an institutional phenomenon that can be regarded as an example of the, a wider process of globalization. Right? Mm. They are, and whether or not, if, if, if I ask you a series of questions about your attitudes towards inequality and incentives on the rest of it, and I do that, it, hard, it, it does not enable me at all to predict whether you voted remain or leave. Left wingers were as likely to vote leave as were right wingers. Okay, The division in the EU referendum was between social liberals and social conservatives. And this is an argument about uh, what it kind of society you are comfortable living in and what kind of society you think Britain should be. So a social liberal is somebody who says, look, I don't care what your religion is. Um, I, your sexual practices are up to you. Uh, the, what moral uh, uh, code you follow is ultimately up to you. What language you speak is up to you. Whether or not you salute the Union Jack, or what symbols you decide to adhere to or respect is up to you. And by the way, I love living in London. It's a fantastic, <laughs> diverse city. Um, so these are people who are comfortable, indeed embrace the idea of social uh, diversity. They're essentially people at the end of the day say, look, it's up to individuals to decide social and moral code and the religious code, etc. they live in. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's an argument uh, uh, we might call a social conservative that says, now look, at the end of the day, if a society is going to have at least an adequate degree of social cohesion, then actually society does need, to some degree at least, need to be able to enforce a common moral code. It's a good idea that actually if we do all have 
some sense of common adherence to a set of national symbols. It is a good idea, certainly, that if we all speak the same language. Um, and of course, also what tends to be true that people of this disposition therefore tend to be rather uncomfortable with a diverse environment. These are the people who would echo Nigel Farage's comment that you know, they are uncomfortable when they cannot hear English being spoken on a bus. These are people, of course, who tend to live outside of London, because if you live in London and you hear English being spoken on a bus, it comes as something of a surprise. <laughs> right? um, so, um, so but, th but this is an important argument about what is the best way of organising society. Now, social liberals voted Remain, overwhelmingly. Social conservatives voted for Leave. Now, this, is an element, this, this has always been an element of our politics. It won't surprise you to hear, because the secret is in the name, Liberal Democrats have always done relatively well amongst social liberals. They by no means get all the social liberals, but those who vote Liberal Democrat are disproportionately social liberal. And, and Liberal Democrats are more clearly demarcated by their social liberalism than being on the left or the right. Indeed, mm. the Liberal Democrat Party tends to swither a bit on the left-right spectrum. You know, it sometimes swings to the left and then it swings back to the right and then it swings back to the left again and tends to call itself centrist. UKIP. UKIP voters, by the way, are not right wing, or those when the UKIP was. <gasps> Mind blown! We're not right wing. <laughs> UKIP voters don't like inequality, right? Um, uh, that there are, the, the, the bit where they will sometimes de uh, depart from others is they're not quite sure they trust the state to do anything about it. <laughs> but you know, remember, UKIPers are people who don't like the way that Britain is going in a whole variety of ways. And it isn't just about immigration. It's also about economic inequality. So UKIPers tend to be on the left, but they're social conservatives. So the thing, therefore, what you would normally have expected in an election in 2017 about Brexit, where you expect the Remainers to go to the Liberal Democrats, and you'd expect the social conservatives and the Leavers to go to UKIP. Well, the, the Leavers decided that their best uh, um, chance was going with the Conservatives and UKIP look, it was beginning to look like a busted flush and the Democrats still struggling to recover from the sins as many people see it of the coalition. Okay, So the two parties whom you would expect and indeed during um, uh, you know, much of the previous period have been articulating that social liberal social conservative divide were relatively weak. So what happened? The Conservatives lost ground amongst Remainers and gained ground amongst um, leavers. Their vote, therefore, become, it was always a bit socially conservative, but their vote becomes more clearly socially conservative. On the Labour side, yes, the Labour Party does gain a ground amongst leavers, but it gains more ground amongst Remainers. One of the things, by the way, that I suspect might now dis, dis, uh, 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 upset ma many of your audience, in my view, in many ways, Jeremy Corbyn in 2017 achieved what Tony Blair had been trying to deliver for years, which was to deliver a middle-class, social liberal, university graduate vote. Corbyn's electorate is much more obviously Blairite than either the Blairites or the Corbynistas would like to believe, because Corbyn was not particularly successful. Uh, well, no more successful than Ed Miliband had been in getting left-wing voters in. His success was getting in social liberals. Now, but then the crucial, so therefore, what we're then getting, we're getting Conservative and Labour not only now having to articulate the left-right divide with which they are comfortable, but they're now having finding themselves articulating this social liberal, social conservative divide. Around 70% of the conservative vote is socially conservative, right? And it's Remainer. Around 70% of the Labour vote is social liberal, and it is it, uh, conservative vote is Lever. The Labour vote is is Remainer. Mm. Um, and given that, there is virtually no statistical link. So, so. The probability that you are on the left in the way that I have defined it is more or less unrelated to whether you're a social liberal or a social mm. conservative, right? So we've now got these two dimensions. Now, if you think about it, if you've got two dimensions, all right, and you're going to articulate those two dimensions and they're orthogonal to each other, at right angles to each other, you really need four parties. Yes. Yeah. But it's being articulated by two. So conservative and labor are both being deeply disrupted because they are now finding themselves tackling an issue which is not a left-right issue, um, it's an issue that taps a different set of values, a set of values that they are, are not at heart of what they are about, but which is deeply disruptive of their normal electoral coalitions. And therefore, they are struggling to deal with 
the issue, as well as the fact we're also deeply polarized about Brexit. So that's the sense in which the party, so the irony is that the success of the party, you know, 2017 was this election in which ironically, the level of support for Conservative and Labour combined was higher than it had been in any election since 1970. But underneath that edifice was the fact that the, the, the base of their vote created both parties really serious problems and you know and it's in, the, mo the, the most obvious way it comes out is this at the end we tend to think of the conservative party as being a party that um it promotes the interests of big business but the electorate that the conservative party has gained is a protectionist electorate it's an electorate that is looking for some shelter from the winds of globalization mm. The very globalization process that big business thinks is helping it to uh, to to you know achieve better things and achieve business. Etc. So there's now so the, the problem for this other conservative party is this tension between its traditional backers and the nature of its electorate. And you see, you know, you now you now get conservative. Business. How is it that my party is doing these things? It's so bad for big business. But that's the tension it's facing. The tension on the Labour side is. Although the Labour Party these days is pretty much, is almost as popular amongst university graduates as it is amongst those in working class occupations, the Labour Party still thinks of itself as a party that represents the working class. And of course, it's more working class uh, and is more of, of its vote that tended to vote leave. So you've therefore got this attachment to the more working class end of its vote because that's part of the historical mission. It's the people who they think that they represent. And therefore, there, there perhaps is a greater concern about the consequences of upsetting that section of his vote, even though it's very clearly a minority of his vote, than would otherwise be the case. So you can see how the Brexit divide cuts across the party's traditional conceptions of themselves and who they think of as being their traditional allies. And Corbyn and uh, the Labour Party have sort of turned their back almost on the Leavers who voted for them by saying that they're going to embrace, I think, is it a second referendum that they were talking about? Oh, that's a much, that's, a, that's far too simple a uh, articulation of whether they were Your turn about. to get destroyed, <laughs> mate. Fantastic. Let's go. The, the Labour Party position is essentially that if and only if Theresa May can get her deal through the House of Commons and the House of Lords, she then has to pass a second hurdle, which is it needs to win a referendum where Remain would be the option. The Labour Party has not committed itself to um, being in favour of a referendum should we get precipitated into an early general election. It still reserved its position on that. And it also isn't saying that um, we are therefore willing to allow Theresa May's deal to go through the House of Commons. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's a limited move. Um, it's a move that certainly indeed the party has felt it had to make because, you know, about 60% of Labour voters are in favour of a second EU referendum. And that at the end of the day is the, you know, is the, is the bigger end of its constituency. But it's not gone so far as to come out in an unalloyed fashion. And there's a cru particularly a crucial difference between what the Labour Party is proposing and what um, Peter Carl and his colleague Wilson um, uh, were, were, were proposing. So the, the, there, I think, was a very adroit uh, attempt to move the debate on. So, that, so the Carl Wilson amendment, um, at least as originally drafted, we'll wait and see what comes out next week, was, you know what? We'll let Theresa May's deal go through the House of Commons so that she can have the chance to put her vote, her deal to the public. And I think that's my better point. I mean, I, I'm pretty critical of the People's Vote campaign because the People's Vote campaign has been so much uh, framed in terms of the people were lied to, um, all these false claims. They now know what it, uh, they now know much more about what it's about. Oh, and by the way, the opinion polls tell us that the Remain are now ahead. Ergo, therefore, we should have a referendum. It's not an argument that is ever going to persuade Leave voters that perhaps we should have another referendum. Whereas what, what once you, with the Carl Wilson referendum, I think, uh, 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 proposal is much more uh, politically adroit. It's saying to Leave voters, yeah, she's struggling to get it through the House of Commons. Yeah, you don't trust the House of Commons, do you? But it's, this is the establishment ganging up on the Leave programme. We are willing to put it back to you. 
You decide. And I think weeks ago, the, the moment that it was clear that Theresa May's deal was in trouble, the People's Vote campaign should have moved on and they should have tried to reach out to those on the Leave side. But the trouble is, those involved in the People's Vote campaign, I think, are so much the committed Remainers that I think the ideological vision has blinkered to them to what would have been the politically astute move. I mean, not least because at the end of the day, if you're going to get a second referendum, persuading Labour was one of the steps, but almost undoubtedly not a sufficient step. Above all, you need to persuade sections of the Conservative Party. You need particularly to persuade that middle rump of the Conservative Party, which will vote for Theresa May's deal, but certainly won't vote for no deal, and are desperate for, kind of, for us to get out of all of this, and that this is, this is the way out, but you're not going to persuade them by, by a... a um, set of proposals that just look like an attempt to reverse Brexit. So um, that's... You, know, the, the you use words other... like reach out and persuade. Yep. We don't seem to be doing much of that these days. It seems to me like it's more that we've split into yep. extremes. Yep. And what worries me, and we, we talked about it before we started the show, was what happens in several eventualities that are possible. <laughs> we have the no deal, Yep. which is we leave on WTO terms. Yep. Yep. We have Theresa's May deal. Yep. Let's say that goes through. Or we have essentially Brexit thwarted and doesn't happen. Yep. Now, or I, an extension. Or, or potentially an extension. And then, <laughs> and then we go back to the original yeah. doesn't, yeah. Go, hap doesn't yeah. happen, happens, happens under some kind of deal. Yep. Now, as I look at all three of those scenarios, and then I look at what I perceive to be the mood in the country, yep. which is going to be a lot less accurate than what you perceive. But nonetheless, if we look at all of that, I can see in all three of those scenarios a very significant group of people who are going to be deeply, deeply unhappy about yep. what's happened. Yep. What do you think are, are the, is the future of this country in those three scenarios <laughs> and how the different groups well, in society... I, I, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that I think whatever we do, we are going to upset people. There is no easy way out of where we find ourselves uh, because... Uh, we are essentially polarized. Mm. We're, you know, we are polarized between a, at least a, you know, somewhere between a half and two thirds of Leave voters would at the end of the day, they either say leaving without a deal is what I would most like to happen, or they say, in some cases, I'm, that's what I'm willing to do. Okay. Around two thirds of Remainers go, I want another referendum and around three quarters of Remainers, whether they want a referendum or not, at least still say, you know, we, despite all the other choices around, I'm definitely a Remainer and most of them say that they would vote the same way. So we are, we are deeply polarised. And one of the difficulties about Brexit is that, you know, we often talk about how supposedly what politicians should do is to search for the centre ground. Mm. The problem with, uh, but that's based on the assumption. It's based on the assumption that basically, to use the jargon, the distribution of attitudes in our society is unimodal, i.e. there are lots of people in the middle, lots of people who you are... You just lost 90% of our audience. Yeah, yeah, okay. well, I'm just <laughs> and about me to, and Francis. I'm just about to explain. <laughs> so there are lots of people, so if we think of it being a, you know, a, just a left-right debate for the moment, that most people are in the middle. They're neither very left-wing nor very right-wing. They're centrist, yeah. okay? Mm. And there aren't very many people on the extreme left and the extreme right. right. And the point is that if you are therefore trying to win an election, the argument is you therefore need to go towards the centre because mm. that's where most voters are. Yeah. You might be at centre-right, centre-left, but you need to be in the centre. The trouble with Brexit is, in my view, is the distribution's completely different. It's, it's U-shaped, mm. right? So there are lots of people on what we might want to call the extreme leave end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. There are lots of people on what we might want to call the extreme remain end of the spectrum, and there aren't that many people in the middle. Me and Francis, <laughs> yeah. that's it. And Well, wherever you find yourselves. <laughs> if you're in the middle, you're rather lonely, I'm afraid. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you see this, I mean, so the, the irony of, of what's been going on, I think, is that both Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, in their ways, have been trying to find a Brexit compromise. Not least because of the reasons I've been explaining about how Brexit divides their parties and causes them such tension. You know, 
Theresa May's compromise, which is what her deal tries to encapsulate, is, well, look, I've got certain fixed lines. I think we have to get out of freedom of movement because of the concerns about immigration. Um, we, uh, we've got to get out of the European Court of Justice because of the concerns about sovereignty. And we should be able to make our own trade deals, which, again, is partly about sovereignty and partly an argument about whether or not the EU is or isn't a protectionist organisation, which is a very, very long-running debate. But then within, within those red lines, which is the kind of the kernel of the Leave case, However, we then need, I think, what was the phrase, as frictionless a relationship with the EU as possible. So then she's buying into the Remain argument that we do still need to have a close trading relationship with the EU because it's still 55% of our external trade. So that's her compromise. Jeremy Corbyn's compromise is a softer Brexit than hers. It's, you know, Norway plus mine. Well, it's, it's single market minus, but with customs union added. So it's a kind of variant of Norway. Um, but um, uh, it's, you know, Corbyn's rhetoric is we need to bring together the 52% who voted remain and the 42% who voted leave. And we think this is the way to do it. So we're acknowledging the concerns about freedom, uh, 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 freedom of movement. We certainly have concerns about the limitations on the state aid rules of the, of the European Union. Um, uh, but, you know, we need to have a, we need to have a close relationship. Now, but, so they're both compromises. OK. The trouble is what you discover is that when you ask people to choose either between Mrs. May's deal and Remain and No Deal, you find that Mrs. May's deal is the least popular of the three options. But it's also the case if you ask people to choose between Remain, what we will for the purposes of shorthand call Norway, which is roughly where Labour are at, and No Deal, Norway is third. And the problem, and, 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 and although it's true that you can you can argue that around a half of the public would be willing to accept a kind of Labour Party type soft Brexit, and we suspect that there's a majority for that in the House of Commons. The trouble is, it's a Remainer project, uh, a soft Brexit of the kind the Labour Party is talking about. Although it was designed to try to bridge the divide between Remain and Leave, at the end of the day, is something that Remainers might be willing to buy into because it's, no, it's a soft Brexit. It's leavers are reluctant to buy into it. So it's very, very difficult to find the compromise that will satisfy people. So yes, you're right. The problem we then face is this. If we leave without a deal, mm -hmm. a lot of people will be deeply upset. All right? Um, so there's a, a, as I already said, a substantial body of leave voters will go yippee, but the clear majority of the public, around two, and maybe as much as two thirds of the public will be at least unhappy, and in some cases will be deeply, deeply upset. Avocado sales are really going to fall. In yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, whatever. I mean, it's, sure. Uh, anybody who knew anything about um, uh, the food in, uh, industry would have known the 29th of March was the worst time for this country to potentially be cut off yeah. from its food supplies. It's the lowest level of, of food availability from domestic sources. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, but equally, if we go for a second referendum, given at least the nature of the support for it, as I have described, that also is going to upset a, lot of pe upset a lot of people. So can one say, can one criticize the idea of a second referendum on the grounds that it will be deeply divisive? Yes. But can one, div uh, can one also criticize the idea of leaving without a deal as being deeply divisive? Also, yes. Yeah. So both the things which are the two most popular options are potentially, you know, uh, the difference deep, there, Johnny, deeply divisive. But the difference there is that people voted to leave, right? <laughs> people didn't vote to have a second referendum. That's the difference between those two uh, things. That's true. But the, but the problem you have is that although a substantial body of Leave voters voted for no deal, mm. there is a substantial minority of Leave voters who are opposed to the idea. And you put them with the Remain voters and it's clearly not obviously yeah. um, wow. uh, the, 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 the public preference. You can see preference. why Theresa May is in trouble, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, why have UKIP therefore collapsed? Shouldn't, be the, shouldn't this be the most yeah. fertile, yes. rich point yes. in UKIP's history where they come in, they go to Tories, Lib, um, well, not Lib Dems, they're it's irrelevant Tories. anyway, and yeah, and then no, bring it, them all into no, the no, fold. No, no, it's Tories. I mean, I mean, part of the history, of the, you know, again, one of the, the, the reasons why Theresa May, May's deal is, is unpopular is that, it, is that particularly starting with the Chequers Agreement of last summer, support for her and her deal fell particularly heavily amongst Leave voters. So her problem now is that Leave voters are almost as likely to oppose their deal as Remain voters. But she's, she lost the confidence of Leave voters during the course of the Brexit negotiations. Chequers 
was a crucial moment. And then the unveiling of the deal itself in mid-November saw support for her position fall even further amongst Leave voters. Um, so, um, you know, that's the problem that she finds herself in, which is she, it isn't obvious that those who voted Leave actually back the idea uh, that she's in favour of. But, I mean, the, the other thing to bear in mind is this, you know, let's say her deal goes, so we could therefore say, we could say, well, no deal divisive, um, EU referendum divisive, well, let's take the least worse option of the thing that's on the table and let's just let the deal through. Bear, uh, bear in mind, that's not going to stop the argument. We have barely started the argument. Because all we will do, if we were to let the deal go through, is to mean that the withdrawal treaty becomes legal force. What does the withdrawal treaty do? It protects the rights of EU citizens. It commits the UK to paying roughly 39 billion quid for the next two or three years into EU coffers. Um, and it's got the provisions about the so-called Northern Ireland backstop to try to avoid any risk of there having to be a border between the North and the South of Ireland. Nothing else. We've not talked about whether, what, I mean, the political declaration sa says the UK doesn't want to be in freedom of movement, and we recognise that. But the political, declaration is, the political declaration essentially says, look, how much, how close a relationship the UK has will depend on what rules the UK is willing to follow. Now, if it's not willing to do freedom of movement, it won't be able to be in the single market. And if it's not willing to follow UCJ rules, it'll be in the Cups and Union, and certainly, um, it, sorry, um, it, 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 that will also limit its options. But beyond that, it doesn't say anything. We, for, you know, it doesn't settle those basic things like European health cards, mobile phone calls, um, uh, what actually would be the, what, what relationship with the single market we have, what regulations we're going to follow, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to carry on arguing for at least another two years until the end of the transition period, may well be longer. And for example, I fast forward for you. It is October 2020. Somehow, or, you know, the government, we've still got the current government. Somehow or another, Theresa May's got a uh, deal has gone through. We now have a new deal, maybe not negotiated by Theresa May. Maybe she resigned after the, uh, shortly after the end of the, uh, we left the European Union. And... The Prime Minister is struggling to get his or her deal through the House of Commons because they don't like the new proposed treaty on our relationship with the European Union. We could go through the whole of this cycle again because at that point we will be defining many of the things about our future relationship that at the moment people are worried about. So why are people concerned about the Northern Ireland backstop? What well, the essential reason? I think is because it potentially constrains the free trade deal that we can have. It pushes it pushes us towards having a closer relationship than some Brexiteers would like. Um, but we've not had this argument. So look forward to more and more. So, the, so frankly, even if Mrs. May's deal goes through, well, A, it's going to go through grudgingly, but it'll still be divisive because we're still going to be arguing about whether or not we should be coming out of freedom of movement, what are the consequences, et cetera, et cetera. This is going to be a very long running story. There is no avoidance of division on Brexit because it's, we fa re resolving Brexit is a very, very difficult issue. Do you think it was a mistake, the referendum? Well, um, I understand why it happened. <laughs> and put it like this, it was, I mean, I, I will say two things. I mean, at the end of the day, um, it's very difficult to sustain a set of political arrangements, which basically, you know, by which I mean giving people authority to make the law of the land. All right. It's very difficult. So this is a question about whether it's very difficult to continue to maintain a set of arrangements that says institution X has the authority to determine the law for this bit of territory. It's very difficult to do that and continue those arrangements if the people to whom the law applies do not regard that institution mm. as being a legitimate source of authority. You know, we had this debate in Scotland in 2014 about whether or not it was legitimate for the United Kingdom to be able to make the law for Scotland or not. And again, the argument here at the end of the day is that, you know, is it legitimate for the European Union to be able to make some of the law for 
the United Kingdom because we are sharing our, you know, sharing our sovereignty. And the, you know, and the fundamental failure of the European project in this country, in my view, is that it failed to instill in the UK population the sense that we are European. And at the end of the day, what tends to underpin a willingness to share a, a set of uh, uh, political institutions is a common sense of identity. So why, you know, albeit with some considerable fraying at the edges in Scotland and Northern Ireland, for the most part, the majority of the population in the UK accept the authority of parliament and government, etc. Well, because in part we feel British. So we're all us. OK, the problem for the European project in this country is that only around one in eight of us or so feel European. Europe is other. And therefore, it was always impossible for basically to use the, the, the simple um, colloquial lingua. Why are Brussels bossing us about? Because Brussels is not us. It's that funny place on the other side of the English Channel of which we do not feel part. The, they are the Europeans. We are the Brits. All right. So that's the fundamental issue of identity. And you now you can look at the European Union's own Eurobarometer data, and we are the only country, together with Greece, where a majority of the population at the moment deny deny that they are European. Okay. So that so the truth is, you know, we've never been more than so many detached members of the European Union. We've been in it for what we could get out of it. And when during the last 10 or 20 years, we have experienced by our own historical standards, very high levels of net inward migration. And the brutal truth is that with freedom of movement, you cannot control immigration. This presented a potential problem of legitimacy. So that, that, that's the big answer to you. Now, there's the small answer to you, which is whether David Cameron got his tactics wrong. Almost undoubtedly wrong. I mean, in so far <laughs> as what David Cameron was trying to do was to kill the issue mm. in two senses. His first aim, when with the so-called Bloomberg speech in January 2013, which is what set this whole process in train, his immediate aim was, my gosh, Nigel Farage and UKIP's support has gone up. Our support has gone down. It was the first time that the conservative end of the coalition had been in political trouble. This is the uh, time of omni shambles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he wanted to kill the UKIP challenge. So what does he do? He takes UKIP policy. We have a referendum. But he does so in the expectation that he's never going to have to deliver. Because he's in coalition with the Liberal Democrats, who certainly are willing to have a referendum um, on, on, on our membership at the moment, and who were always blocking any attempts to pass one after Cameron's promise, et cetera, et cetera. And Cameron probably did not expect to get an overall majority in 2015. Mm. Right? Mm. Okay. So, um, so in the end, it failed to scupper UKIP, in the short run at least, only after the referendum, ironically. <laughs> he, he then... Um, he then found himself with a promise he hadn't expected to, to, to deliver. I, th I think he then made a third mistake, and the third mistake from his point of view was that he rushed at it too quickly. Um, he was clearly wanting to move on. He had a, a substantial domestic agenda he wanted to pursue. Like he's already time-limited his premiership as being, being back 2019, 2020. He told us we were, he wasn't going to go for another term. Um, what he and what you know, he was expecting to be able to do a hard work. I mean, he's doing exactly the same thing that Howard Wilson did in 74 75. Howard Wilson became prime minister on a promise to hold a referendum on our membership of the then common market after he had renegotiated the terms of our membership. Now, Wilson pulled it off, he came back from the country in March 1975 and said, I've renegotiated our terms of membership, it's all fine and dandy. Public opinion swung around, and we voted two to one to stay inside the common market. Cameron didn't succeed in pulling off the same trick. He wasn't given enough by the European Union. But what he should have been willing, uh, been willing to do is he, and he'd done this before to great theatrical effect, he should have been willing to play it much longer. He should have been willing to walk out of a European Council and go, they're not giving me what I want. This is not good enough. The negotiations have broken down and to play it long. Um, and the point war would have been that if he had made it if he'd apparently been more determined and apparently more robust with the European Union, he might have been in then in a better position to turn it around. But then, and then of course, you know, 
put it into I mean, then the other, I guess, final mistake he made was, you know, he was the last person to go around saying, if we leave the European Union, the world will collapse tomorrow, because this was somebody whose political record was as a Eurosceptic. Um, he had said that if negotiations didn't go well, he'd be willing to argue in favour of leaving. And he failed to appreciate that once he, the European Council had not turned public opinion around and above all had not turned his party around, that he was no longer prime minister. He was leader of the opposition and that he was dependent on the opposition, i.e. the Labour Party, to get himself out of the jam. But did he talk to Lord Mandelson or many another ardent Remainer about how the campaign should be fought? No. They mistakenly misunderstood uh, what they had done in Scotland has been a success of fighting essentially a negative campaign about the economic consequences. It was not a success in Scotland. It was a failure and it did not work this time. So there's lots and lots of tactical mistakes mm. and including, you know, it didn't achieve its original objective. It was a promise that, you know, be careful what you promise it, be, and because sometimes your promises you have to deliver even though you don't expect to do so. And then having found himself hoisted by his own petard, I think then he did not pay enough attention uh, to actually, from his perspective, play it in such a way that might have increased his chances of actually uh, getting a Remain vote. Those tactical issues aside, though, it, and we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Those tactical issues aside, from what you're saying about our cultural attitudes towards Europe and how we feel about ourselves in this country, yeah. it seems almost inevitable that we would come to a point where the issue of our membership of the EU would come to the fore, given that we don't really feel European. And as you say, the levels of immigration that we've seen in this country over the last 20 years. Sure. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, it, I mean, it's a, it, absolutely. You know, I mean, the, I mean, the issue of our uh, membership of the European Union has has kept on being an issue ever since 1975. Yeah. All right, yeah. you know, not long after the referendum in 1975, the Labour uh, the Labour Party, particularly after 1979, came out in favour of us leaving the European Union. Um, there was then a narrow period in the late 80s and early 90s when both political parties were strongly in favour. After the Labour Party changed its mind. But then once, uh, you know, uh, post Maastricht and the fall of Margaret Thatcher, uh, the Euroscats increased inside the Conservative Party. And again, you know, we, we sure we've long been un, you know, uncertain. Um, and yes, I mean, at the end, of the, I mean, the, the difficulty for the Remain side was, yeah, it's partly about immigration and the fact that, you know, indeed immigration had been high. That you know, in two thousand, you know, ironically, in two thousand and four, we were the most pro-Europhile mm. country, along with Sweden and Ireland. We gave the citizens of the then so-called A8 countries, you know, Poland, Czech Republic, etc., the immediate freedom of movement rights, and we were told oh, they won't want to come. I mean, who wants to come to this wet, miserable, <laughs> dark, cloudy yeah. country? Yeah. You know, it's us who want to go to live by the mm. Mediterranean. Mm. No, of course they came, and the Polish problem became, etc., etc. Et um, and then, of course, in 2010, Cameron said he was going to get net migration down to less than 100,000. We've never got anywhere near. So there's that sense of failure. So that's one of the problems. The other problem, however, is, is of course, is also the fallout from the financial crash and the eurozone crisis. Back in 20, 1975, it was very, very easy to argue why the UK should remain, as it only just recently joined the then common market. It was the six original members of the common market have enjoyed much higher and much more sustained levels of economic growth than we have. We have been the sick man of Europe. Mm. You know, as soon as we turn on the taps of public spending, inflation goes up. As soon as we turn them off again, unemployment goes up. We have this stop-go economy. Well, by 2016, Rather than being portrayed as an unalloyed economic success, the European Union's economic credentials were, at least, shall we say, more debatable. Mm. And the Eurozone you know, and how the crisis had been dealt with raised questions about you know, its effectiveness as an, org as an economic organisation. And although this country did take a pretty big hit in 2008, it was certainly coming out of the financial crash much more quickly than particularly many a Southern European, European Union member. Ergo, the economic case was more difficult to argue. So, yeah, so given that our relationship was always a transactional one, mm. economic argument, more problematic. Immigration argument, well, it was never there in 1975. Mm. 
Now, and then you've still then got the continued that those who never ever accepted the idea that you would be in the European in the first place put all that together, and yes, it becomes problematic. And how much of do you do you think that that vote was a rebellion, which is what people have classed it as, as a working class people giving two fingers up to Cameron and the ruling elite, as it were? I think I mean it's, it, it, it's fair to say that. Um, Certainly, a populist narrative is also part of the mix. Um, you know, the idea uh, certainly that you know that, that, that there's an elite out there which is running things against our interest. Um, I wouldn't use the language of class; I would use the language of educational background. Mm. Um, but certainly, um, you know, again, if you you know listen to leave discourse, it's about how the true the the interests of ordinary people are being, um, you know, uh, commandeered, are being distorted by, you know, the liberal establishment who tend to be university graduates who've had this wonderful liberal education the rest of us have paid for, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, uh, so there's the sense of being, dis you know, being distorted not only by the state, but also distorted by those in, in big business. You know, that's certainly part of the sentiment. Um, but it's then, but I, I would then say, you know, it's that sentiment together with a socially conservative discourse you know, and a concern about sovereignty. It's, it, it's all those things together. But yes, given that we are talking about a situation in which, you know, we are having, I think, you know, behind all of this, this, we are having a debate about the process of globalization. At the end of the day, you know, you know one of the ways of thinking about it is this. Um, I, I've, I, you know, earlier I described the argument as being about immigration and about social liberals and social conservatives, mm. partly being a, as being a cultural one, but it's also an economic one. At the end of the day, if you are a university graduate, where particularly you've got a linguistic qualification or you've got a professional qualification, freedom of movement is an opportunity. Mm. Mm. If, on the other hand, you are an older person, you have little in the way of labour market skills. Immigration is something that happens to you. Yes. People from elsewhere come to your neighborhood, a neighborhood which perhaps has not previously had much experience of net inward migration. And what's the advantage to you? So there's that. And then, of course, there's, then there's the broader argument about globalization. Well, hang on. Living standards for most people have not been increasing. Indeed, in some cases, they've been declining. Although overall levels of inequality have not necessarily increased, we've certainly not managed to reverse the sharp increase in inequality that occurred in the 1970s and 1980s. And at the very top of the income spectrum, at least, you know, there, there, are, there are arguments to be had. So against, against the back of all of that, yes, you can see how a focus on this institution whose legitimacy was always questionable which seems to be uh, you know, articulate, it seems to be promoting the forces of globalization that don't seem to be doing as, some of us much good, and from which, frankly, we'd like a bit of protection, both economically and culturally. How that mix does help to bring about the mood that we have. Well, we have time for one final question, mm -hmm. which is the question we always ask, which is what is the one thing that we're not talking about as a society that we ought to be talking about? Well, this is still going to be about Brexit, but we've spent the last hour or so talking about Remainers and about Leavers. Yes. But if we were to have another referendum, at the moment it looks as though the crucial group could be those who did not vote in June 2016. So we do lots of polling data. Remainers think this, Leavers think this. Well, 30% of the population didn't vote in 2016. Some of them, and, and there are now people who were 16 and 17 in 2016 who now could vote. And insofar as the polling data does suggest that maybe we would get a small majority in favour of Remain a second time around, if there were a second time around, the reason for that is not essentially because those who voted two years ago changed their minds, but rather that those who didn't vote two years ago now seem to have made up their minds rather late in the day but they are at least two to one in favor of Remain. So the story of those who did not vote two years ago might be perhaps the most important story about the Brexit process. And insofar as you know, we can perhaps critically evaluate the rhetoric about the people have spoken, therefore they will have to be implemented. Well, almost in, in although the turnout was high by 
uh, standards of recent general elections. At the end of the day, there was still a substantial body of people who did not vote. And the outcome was close. And inevitably in those circumstances, you can always go around and ask, well, is it still the will of the people now? Well, maybe we will or won't find out. Certainly, the one thing it's easier to say that the will of the people is definitely to leave, a much clearer thing is the people are divided. Glad we've solved it then. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Sir John Curtis, thank you very much You're for welcome. coming on the show. Uh, you mentioned Twitter. Are you on Twitter? Do you use it yourself? I have two institutional accounts. So I have at what UK thinks in which I promote and occasionally comment on um, attitudes towards Brexit. Mm -hmm. And I also have an account called what, uh, what Scots Think, which is about um, public attitudes towards the constitutional debate in Scotland. And they're associated with two websites that follow uh, these two stories. I also saw there's a Twitter account which, uh, which is called something like Sir John on TV. Indeed, there is a spoof account. Um, where uh, uh, the, the, the story behind that's very, I, I think I, I know, is that um, on the 18th of April 2017, which is the day that Theresa May announced the 2017 general election, I was sitting quietly in an office in Edinburgh where I, I work one day a week. It was the Tuesday after Easter, thinking, oh, you know, nice quiet day, you can get on with things, you know, phone <laughs> ring, you know. And I get rung up by the news channel, BBC, and they say, um, the Prime Minister's about to make an announcement. Um, we're not quite sure what it is. We're not sure whether she's saying she's ill and she's resigning or what, or, but maybe there's going to be an election. So I said, I tell you what, get me a cab. I'll go down to the BBC studio in Edinburgh. And if it's about something else, I'll just quietly go away. And if it is a general election, I'll be there. Well, of course, it's about a general election. You know, three hours broadcasting later, I managed just about to escape in order to pick up my belongings from where I'd left them, come back again, do about another two hours of broadcasting. And I think there probably was a non-insubstantial body of people, or at least somebody on Twitter, who went, why the hell is this guy on a TV all the time? Well, I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I think that's when it started, and then it's kind of right. You know, it's kind of mushroomed after that. But to give you some idea of how recherche this group of people can sometimes be, I'm certainly aware that on one occasion, I think it was just after the 20th century, I did something for Flemish television. You know, you know really big audience in this country. <laughs> Somebody watched it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. And we are, as always, at TriggerPod on all the social media. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Click the bell button next to the subscribe button and give us a review on iTunes. We will see you in a week from now with another brilliant episode. Thanks, guys. See you next week.